I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... My name is Carly I. I am an illustrator and a tattoo artist. My name has actually been published in in comic books, mm-hmm. spelled incorrectly. Oh, um, really? Yes. And if you look my name up, spelled in the three different ways the correct way, I-H-D-E-I-D-H-E and E-Y-E-D, you will always find me. So <laughs> so all roads lead to Carly. <laughs> Did you buy those domains? No, it's just a Google thing. So many people have looked it up in so many different ways that it'll always somehow get to me. So that's good. <laughs> I love how the publishers are like, I know those are the four letters, just put them together in some random format for us. Exactly. And, and it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it happens all the time and it happens at least every year and usually I'm able to catch it but unfortunately because it was a big company I was not able to catch that running out the door and we've just accepted that that comic book unfortunately there's lots of kind of directory sites where you can look up comic book artists right. and I'm in there twice but spelled two different ways so, so you don't have much competition at least there's not people no, going I, like no no that's not this Carly Eyed it's the other Carly Eyed you would be surprised there's actually another Carly Eyed in really? Green Bay yes in Green Bay yes in Green Bay she came to one of my comic book signings and she's like hi I'm Carly Eyed and I was like no you're not <laughs> <laughs> but, but she is and she's younger than me i think she's maybe 18 19 and surprisingly enough she's also an artist now she spells her first name differently but her last name's the same this and is like some sci-fi plot here like yes <laughs> she's yeah, also an artist that- she's younger she's the new model they built her to come and get you <laughs> And I, I like her work. I love what she does. I do feel a little bit bad because I've kind of paved the way for Carly Eyes everywhere to kind of be difficult to find. What was the event that you were at that you met her? I think it was Powers Comics in Green Bay. I was doing a signing at either Free Comic Book Day or just Comic Book Day in general. Uh, I was doing a signing and I brought a bunch of prints and yeah, she's popped up and, and we've been friends on Facebook ever since. So. Oh, well see, that's a nice yeah. ending. I like oh, that. Yeah. I've been following cool. you for a while and I love your, I love your comic book style. It's that one where it's like, it's what I aspired to do when I was growing up and then finally realized like, I'm going to just stick with the cartoony stuff that I do. Oh, <laughs> I love comics so much. Anything from like, Frank Frazetta and Bernie Wrightson, and then more modern artists like Adam Hughes and John Gordon Murphy, who does uh, Punk Rock Jesus. Anyone who's got like a unique inking style and a lot of movement and curvature to their work. I'm just, I just love, uh, that's what I went to school for. I went to college at the Kubert School in New Jersey uh, to draw comic books. As a kid who read comics, you can you can solve this question for me. So what's that school like? Because we all knew about it. All of us reading yeah. comics knew what that place was. Absolutely. So what's it like? You feel like it's this imaginary place that's on a cloud in space or something. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Well, well, I do have a confession, and all of the gatekeepers out there are going to gasp in fright. But I actually did not read comics as a kid. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I was. So the reason I fell upon them was because I loved animation. And everyone told me no one is going to hire animators anymore because it's all about the digital animation. And I was obsessed with the hand drawn. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I want to be a storyboard artist because people are still hiring for storyboard artists, whether whether it's an animation studio or even at advertisement. I wanted to be in film, but I wanted to work uh, in a sequential uh, movement sort of way. And I thought, well, how what kind of school is going to train me to work sequentially? And then that's when I fell upon the Hubert School. So I didn't read comic books until probably my junior or senior year of high school hmm. because I decided I wanted to do storyboarding. But that school, man, any human being who wants to do illustration or comics, either way, or any sort of sequential work, I would strongly, strongly suggest that school. It is... It is a trade school for comics and for art. Mm -hmm. You don't do anything else but art. There are no classes that do not have to do 
what you want to do, which is amazing. It's two classes a day. Each class is two hours and 45 minutes long. It's Monday through Friday. So it's just constant, constant. So there's 10 classes a week, and each class gives out three to five hours of homework per night. What you kind have, of homework? Like, what do they do? It's it's all art. So there'll be, you know, draw 100 hands by next week or mm. draw... And this is literal. And these are all 10 classes are giving huge assignments like this. It's not like college where you have a huge project due at the end of the semester. Yeah. Every huge project is due the following week. And we'll have we'll have full oil paintings that have to be done by the next week, along with 10 other assignments. So a lot of students, including myself, had about two to three all nighters a week. And we were running real low on on sleep. But and I will say this is is if you want practice, this is the place to go. Mm-hmm. If you like to be disciplined in artwork, this is the place to go. But it is absolutely not for the faint of heart. This is for someone who who is prepared to work constantly. Because if you were to get one assignment in late, that immediately drops the grade down a whole letter grade. Mm -hmm. And if you get any lower than a C plus, I believe, or maybe just like a C, then you immediately fail. And you immediately, you immediately fail the course and you immediately get kicked out. The only way to get that grade back is to pay when I was there was 260, but it may be more than that. So, so any assignment you got in late, you had to either pay it back or get kicked out. You had to um, you had to pay for wasting like the class's time or something. Absolutely. Oh wow, yep. it was, that's an interesting it was, model. It was to stop yourself from getting kicked out, and or you could just do the projects. Uh-huh. You could just be a hard worker. Which both my parents were middle school teachers. We did not have the money to just shovel out two hundred sixty dollars per assignment. So I got those things done. <laughs> Damn. But the school had a two thirds dropout rate. I would imagine. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we started, I think, with about 90, 97 students. And by the time it's a three year course. And by the time we graduated three years later, there were 23 of us uh, graduating. It's like a freaking reality show or one of those competition shows. Yep, exactly. And, and, <laughs> wow. and, you know, not to not to bring it here, but out of that only there were only two women who graduated with me. So how many so started was, out, though, when we started out, I think, man, I would say maybe maybe 13. So there's a decent amount of us. But, okay. you know, it it was a mixture of difficulty. Obviously, stress was a huge factor. Yeah. And I know, obviously, as artists, we struggle with a lot of mental illness. And, and it mm-hmm. definitely wore on on some people I love very much. And I know some amazing artists who who didn't didn't go all three years. And and, you know, they all have their reasons. You know, it. Uh, I can't say I, I would never say that anyone dropped out out of laziness. There were no, I there, were, it. there were definitely some, but there were some people who dropped out just because of own personal reasons, but it was, it was a hard school. Hmm. And I send people there all the time. I say, look into this. I have like three crates at here, just filled with artwork. I just have so much artwork. People wonder like how I find the time to, to draw as much as I do. And it's just because that's how we were trained is, is that, is that what you are never done Mm -hmm. ever. Like you finish something and you look at it and you're like, I know that's not finished in my heart or I know I could have done better. Oh, look, here's another here's another chance for me to do the best. Well, um, and comparatively, so, yeah. you're it, the drawing. It's like, oh, I just got to do one thing. Oh, that's nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You said you wanted to get into storyboarding. So had you done storyboarding before? Like I've done storyboarding. I've never officially mm-hmm. been trained in it. Like basically mm-hmm. my, my whole thing, I've just taught myself to do what I like based mm-hmm. on the Hanna-Barbera cartoons that I like yep. oh, yeah. going to the school. I mean, what was your knowledge of it going in as opposed to what you learned there as far as I, storyboarding? I barely had any knowledge going in. Okay. It was just a manner of, of watching animated movies. And, and I would you know, a really, really great way to practice things like that. And it's a great thing to put in your portfolio. If that's something that someone wants to do is to watch animated movies, pick out maybe 
be a two to three minute clip from it and to storyboard that out and just kind of obsess over these characters and do character sketches. And that was pretty much what I, what my experience was Mm -hmm. is designing characters and, and movements and doing those awesome. That was a really big thing on deviant art was, do you remember those? It was like 50 expressions. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Sheets. There were these little templates where you could put in like your original character and then have them do like 50 different expressions. I loved those and those are just my experience was just was just creating my own characters and and experimenting with movement and facial expressions and yeah, I really had little to no Little, little to no training. It was just little one-off pictures and things that I did. And if I showed you A to B, like what I was doing before that school and what I was doing after, I mean, in my opinion, it just, all of that work just catapulted me to just a, I want to say a whole nother level, but I always want to keep modest with it. But it was comparing it for me, like the speed in which I improved was something that would take someone a whole lifetime. And that's why that school was so special to me is because I was constantly working. I just had no, not a single moment where I could coast. It was always improving and just constantly learning. It's just amazing how good I feel about never having to trace something for the rest of my life. And especially as a tattoo artist where almost everything is tracing tracing someone else's work, tracing a photo, tracing. That There's a little room for people. error in that particular field. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, you'll want to trace the stencil. Yeah. But in, in the design aspect of it, you'd be surprised at how many artists will just take somebody else's tattoo and just trace directly over that. And it's unfortunately in my studio, it's a huge no, no, but in other studios, it, no one would bat an eye at something like that. I, I'm not saying that, me drawing everything it definitely doesn't speed the process along but it makes me feel better knowing that my clients get a piece of artwork and it's catered directly to them last season i talked to um a animator by the name of john sanford he reached out to me and uh after talking with him and i'm like why are you listening to my podcast he's worked (laughs) on like major motion pictures he like worked on mulan and stuff and i'm so i'm talking like i've that name is he, he on instagram he is he does uh, a thing called uh chippy and lupus which is like a web comic but like i'm talking to him and i looked him up beforehand and i'm like why is this guy talking to me this is amazing and one of the things he told me was about the the storyboarding i don't think these were his exact words but they're the way i took it they're like the bass players of animation and film yeah. because mm-hmm. nobody nobody studies for it but if you are one everybody needs one Like if you study storyboarding and you're good at it, somebody will always hire you because they'll be like, oh, who can we find for this? I don't know anybody. It was just my dream. And still today, I think, man, I could have done it. But the issue, I think, I'm not sure where John Sanford lives, but. He's out in Burbank. He like, he's in the act, like, you know, where they make the cartoons. (laughs) Yeah. Because for me, the wall I kept hitting was is I lived in Wisconsin and they want the storyboard artist in house, you yeah. know, or, or to at least visit the studio to be able to communicate the the situations and the movements and, and the scripts. And yeah, the wall I just kept hitting is, well, what can I do from my home when I can't afford to live out there? And comics ended up being that is being in, in the Kubert school. I, I knew that I loved comics and I appreciated the art, But I never really kind of thought about doing it until I got to my first and second year. And I said, wow, I love this. I just love every aspect of it. You're the director. You're the cinematographer. You're the lighting expert. You're the, you know, the person doing the hair and makeup in the wardrobe. Like you are the creator of this world. And I just became kind of acutely obsessed. And then you throw the whole inking aspect in and you know, you got your girl. Like I learned inking and I thought this is the most relaxing, enjoyable thing I could think of ever doing. It just, I just felt the flow kind of go from my brain to the tips of my fingers. And I just immediately felt ease. And I thought, this is what I want to do for a while. I even thought I don't want to do any penciling. I just want to ink everything. (laughs) Wow. But yeah, it's once you get the groove, it feels so good, that brush. More of the show after this break. 
So you said you couldn't move out to California. You wanted to stay here in the Midwest. How were you able to find jobs then if that was the oh. case for a lot of things? Well, that's the cool thing about comics is that is not at all anything that needs to be local. You can work in comics from from far away. They have a real good online platform for for sending the work and they have great communication and a lot of it really depends on how involved this the writer is some writers will hand you a script and it'll just say this character is wondering and sitting and and now this character is shocked and things like that and then there's other writers who will be okay, I want a close-up, uh, three-quarter angle, down shot, this far away, and he's looking curious, but he's also worried. So it really depends on which, what kind of writer. Are they hands-on? Are they micromanaging? Are they, or are they kind of let loose and they want us to, to read it uh, ourselves and, and get the feel. But in general, working in comics, it's, it's not usually something that has to be right then and there because it all happens in stages. I find a lot of those things that happen in, you know, a Hollywood studio, it, it's jumping all over and a bunch of different teams are working on different aspects at different times and they want to come together and have meetings constantly to make sure everyone's on the right page. While comics are real step-by-step, step, you get the script, you do the thumbnails, then you'll do the layouts, and then you'll do the final pencils, then the inks, then the colors, then the lettering, then the editing. And it's all a step-by-step step process, and I feel like that lends itself much easier to, to being far away. And there's teams mm-hmm. all over the world. People will hire people from other countries to do their comics, and they can just stay exactly where they are. You but know, with that yeah. ability... What's the competition like? Like, how do you even get in the door doing that? Because say, saying that everybody has access to that is basically yep. what you just said, which is a good yep. thing. But at the same time, like, how did you get the work? How are you even finding where to meet these people? Cuba Q- school. Okay. That's, so that school does not send you out the door with a, with a diploma and kicks your butt and just says, go out there, good luck. <laughs> You don't get a diploma from the Kubert School. They will give you a piece of paper that says congrats, but there's no official diploma. Although if you get to that last year, they will set you up with interviews with all the major comic book companies. They bring them to the school, and they also bring you to the studio with your portfolio. The first year of of the Kubert School is all about learning materials. They throw every single material at you from inking to Dr. Martin dies to digital. That Wait, Dr. Either- Martin dies? What's, what's that? Yeah. Dr. Martin dies are the old, old, old school way of coloring comics. It's not like a watercolor. It's a literal dye that you dilute and, and mix and you put it down on that page and it's not moving. You know, it is very difficult to work with, but it's a dye so that it covers very smoothly and in one tone. They're extremely messy extremely tedious. You have to know exactly what you're going to do when you put it on that page because it's not moving after it's down. But if you are interested in comics and like playing around with different medias, Uh I highly suggest trying those out. But most of us, including myself, we had one course on it. We thought we never want to use this ever again, but it was certainly fun. And then there was another really old school thing we got. They don't even sell this anymore. They stopped producing it in 2008 it's called Duo Shade. Okay. And what it is is the special paper and these two chemicals. And if you put one chemical to the paper, it'll give you a duo tone visual, like spotted look. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And if you put the other one, the other chemical on the paper, it gives you a different one, a different kind of spotted texture. Hmm. And if you layer them on top of each other, it gives you an even different one that will be darker. So you have to imagine, okay, you've got your line work. You want your mid-tones, your 
let's see, like the tone, the next step down from from that, and then your your deep tones, and then from there you got your black. So you've got mm -hmm. three different. It's not extremely interesting. It's the kind of stuff man, that you see in like manga comics and stuff, right? Yes, but it's real old school way yeah. of doing it. And I know a lot of people they've got this interesting kind of sticky paper that right. you can also that's like, the one that I'm out. familiar with. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You can cut it out and then place it where you want your duo shade or duo chrome or whatever you would call it to to go in there and then now people do it digitally obviously there's there's a ton of like manga studio things right. that will allow that that visual effect but but i've actually i still have even though it hasn't been made in over 10 years i still have i think one of the chemicals and then a single piece of paper left from that and i've just been saving it because it's I've actually had multiple people contact me, like offering me money because they just don't have it anymore. It's wow. so rare. But that was one of those materials that we used. Um, you know, they wanted to teach us every single thing so that we would have every every single option at our fingertips. Second year was learning yourself and to build a style and to build a brand. And mm -hmm. a lot of it was you know, make your, make your business cards and who are you as an artist and find yourself like, this is your chance to do that. And then third year was only about building your portfolio because every single assignment was meant to go in that portfolio and to build up to that final interview with those big comic book companies. So it was very meticulous and well thought out the way the school worked. And, yeah. and I was able to kind of find myself there. If you didn't know what you were going to do in the beginning, you sure as hell know what you're going to do at the end. One of the terms that Carly had talked about is something called a gatekeeper in the comics industry. A gatekeeper is, is a term that's used over pretty much any fandom. They're the folks who kind of given themselves this self-proclaimed, we're the ones who say whether you belong in the industry or not, or whether you deserve to be a fan or not. How many times have you said, oh, I love comics, and then someone has, has immediately tried to ask you a question about what's the measurement of Superman's inseam just to see if you are really a true fan. <laughs> okay. you know? But a gatekeeper is someone who would look at what I do and say, oh, you didn't read comics before, then you know, you're not a true fan. Or they see my work and they're like, oh, you're a woman and you like comics. Are you sure you like comics? Let me ask you a bunch of questions to be 100% sure if you know your shit. You don't yeah. need to answer those questions. Those questions, it's only to make those people feel better. It's not anything that you need to prove yourself if you like comics. Even if you're like, I saw a comic drawing once and I loved it. You don't have to prove yourself to say that you're good at what you do or you love what you love. But as I was saying, is, is the gatekeepers in the industry are unfortunately making it really not only hard to get into comics as an artist, but they make it really hard to get into them as a fan. And unfortunately, I believe that those gatekeepers are the ones that are making the industry. Actually, the industry is going a little bit downhill. I had somebody ask me yesterday, do they still make comics? <laughs> <laughs> Have you not gone I, to the movies lately? <laughs> it, it happens. No, it happens all the time. People don't understand that those films come from comics. And they think that if they did come from comics, they're comics that were that were published 20, 30 years ago, people don't understand that they're still being produced every single day. You'd be surprised. I would say, I would say almost 10% of people probably don't realize that comics are still being made, which is really unfortunate because back in the day, every single person read them, you know, you look, you look at Japan and every single demographic has got a manga in their hand. It's, yeah. But if anyone does want to get into comics man there are so many good places to start these days though and i would always want to turn people towards trying i know a lot of people will see these huge like undertakings of of comics but there's a lot of one-offs that are just wonderful comics that got me into it and they're just one-offs the pro which is a hilarious, hilarious comic book mm -hmm. about a prostitute who becomes a superhero. And it's just a single, single trade. And it's so good. And then you've got We Three. We Three is about like three house pets that got lost or something. And, and the government 
took them to their testing facilities and like fixated like robot bodies on these like just normalized house pets. And so they just gave these house pets these like killing machines. Um, and it sounds funny. Like you want to kind of laugh because you're like, oh, this is going to be goofy. No, it is serious as a heart attack. This is a dramatic. Oh, oh, the prostitute dramatic. that becomes the superhero is the funny one. Oh, that's the funny one. For <laughs> and sure. then this one is the serious one about the. This one's very serious. <laughs> wow. and, All right. um, and then Pride of Baghdad. That was another one off that just the artwork is just stunning. It's based off of a true story of a bomb that fell in Baghdad during the war and it exploded by the zoo and obviously a lot of the animals died but a lot of them were set free in Baghdad including a pride of lions and this kind of side story follows these lions as they're kind of walking through a war zone and just discovering this whole new world that they never knew existed outside the walls of this zoo these are great single one-off comics that people can pick up and read in a day and just feel good that they love it that it's gorgeous and that they've helped the industry a little bit and it's easy to get into because you don't have to remember all of these crazy facts and and all these characters it's just these single stories you can learn more about carly at her website carlyide.com the music for this episode is by my band Lorenzo's Music at lorenzosmusic.com. And if you're enjoying the show, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. I'll be back with another episode next week, so until then, so long. Mm-hmm.